for making itself. Uh, before we kick off, though, I want to thank my employer, Binder, for making it able to, for me to be here and talk about this to you guys. Um, yeah, so shared nothing. Those are two words. What is it? Uh, in essence, shared nothing means nothing more than sharing no resources. So all you do is make sure that everything that you run runs on its own CPU, memory, or disks. Uh, you know, any program that you have does that and that alone. Uh, it, it became a very large thing back in the day. I think the first written thing about it is 1983, which is older than I am. Uh, but the good thing about it is that you can make separate units of, of programs. So uh, you can separate your concerns in a way that anything you write does its own thing on its own hardware and doesn't do anything else, which is super useful. Uh, also, it makes you able to uh, scale things independently. So, for example, if you run a website, you can deploy your own code in some way. Uh, if you get a lot of requests on, for example, just your HTML pages, you can scale those servers up and leave the rest as it is. Or if you do a lot of processing on the back end, you can scale that up and leave the front end servers at where they are. Also, it's very resilient against outages. Um, Good example for this is, for example, um, uh, Netflix, who made their own Chaos Monkey thing. Who here has ever used Chaos Monkey? <laughs> Great, so if you've seen it, you're probably well aware of how it can kill your entire network uh, and your entire application, but not if you set it up correctly. Um, and last but not least is loosely coupled. So every little thing can die on its own and then it can be restarted and something will uh, take the features over as it is. More interesting though, shared nothing doesn't mean you share nothing. Uh, lots of things still, especially in the web sphere, uh, if you have a web application, you will be sharing state. P people will be locked in, will be authenticated, you'll be in a certain state of a, of a process, workflows in your application will be shared all over the entire thing and people don't generally do that in one request. So. Uh, every, every step you take, you've got to go on further and further. Um, and additionally to that, because you have all these separate units of things, everything depends on each other in some way. So why would you do shared nothing? Um, easiest reason is, as I said, fault tolerance. Anytime your application has a problem, it can deal with it itself. Your entire architecture is built to make sure that that thing can get back to where it was or get back to a state where it will actually work. Uh, it's, it's scalable, as I said, you can scale independently and it leads to much more smaller and simpler applications. Very good example for this is that you, uh, you can build an application that just does what it does. Welcome. <laughs> The best thing about smaller applications, as, as you're probably well aware, well aware of, is uh, you can test them better, you can manage them better, you can review the code better, you can do anything you want with the code that you have, uh, and, and you can explain it better to other people. So also if you transfer the project or hire new people to work on it, uh, it's just much easier to, to get to a certain point where it's useful to use. Um, it does have some considerations. for. You're going to be simplifying your code base, you're going to make smaller, simpler applications, but if you oversimplify, you're going to make a problem larger instead of smaller. Uh, if you do uh, crazy things like have an entire Python application, you make every function a salary task, everything is going to be slow as balls because it's only communicating over the network with your back end and uh, hoping to get an answer at some point and then all your servers are doing nothing else but communicating to each other. So that's not a good thing. Also, you need to know when you need to start. Uh, if you're just making a web log, like uh, any WordPress website or anything like that, if you're gonna separate those things, you're wasting a lot of time and you're not making anything more useful than it really is. Other than that, you also require a lot of infrastructure. Uh, instead of just having one server that does it, what it is that you do, you're gonna need a whole bunch of servers. You need something to manage your traffic, you're gonna need something to 
relay messages. You're going to need something to do all the functions that you have. And as I said before, because there are simple units, simple smaller units, uh, you're going to have yeah, just a whole bunch of things that do their own thing. You cannot share the server with any other feature that you are building. So your login page server, for example, cannot suddenly also do the authentication if you do it in the wrong way. Um, and apart from that, you're still sharing state, so you still require a source of truth. It's, I know that databases are one of the origins of shared nothing, but it's also, it's a Q's heel. You're, you'll be storing stuff in there and you'll not be able to scale that in the same way as you can do with your application. Uh, this goes for your databases, but also for your caching layers, for example. So where would you be using shared nothing? Uh, I know two very good examples of the share nothing website. Uh, one is Google. I'm pretty sure you all know what Google is. If you don't, please raise your hand. Uh, or Binder, which is where I work, obviously. Uh, yeah, it, it means at scale. It just means that we do a lot of things. It's everywhere, it's all over the world. Uh, it's, it's all working in, in cooperation with each other. And as I said, it's very scalable. Uh, obviously, data warehousing is also an option by virtue of share, sharding your data. I'm going to skip that one, but I wanted to list it because this is where it all came from. So what are you going to need to build it? It's an empty slide because I'm sharing nothing. <laughs> uh, anyway, first you're going to ingest the traffic. You're going to get traffic from your clients, your users. They need to get to your application. So this is basically your load balancer or uh, any web server that you have. I want to make it more tangible, so we got an example for this. We use Nginx. When this gets the message, it just passes it on to the application server, which we call the front-end application. Uh, this, this does nothing more than gets your request, hacks it into pieces, and determines for itself what it wants to do and how it needs to do that. So. Uh, because I'm branding things anyway, uh, we use Pyramid for this. Pyramid is pretty awesome, but you could also use PHP or uh, Node.js if you're so inclined, or anything in, in Go if you've been to those kind of talks today. Um, what it does, though, it, it makes new tasks, and those tasks need to be executed, and the only way to get that done is to insert a message queue into the stack. So there's a message queue. It does nothing more than get the message and give it to somebody else. So, uh, for example, we use Celery for this. It's not necessarily just Celery. We run it on uh, Redis, for example, but you could also be deploying it on RabbitMQ or any other things. And I heard somebody talk about OpenRQ recently. Maybe that's fun, too. I haven't checked it out yet. And then, in the end, you, you, you end up with a whole bunch of servers on the, in the rear of your application stack and it's the backend processing. This can be literally anything that can read messages from your uh, message queue. We use Python things, we use Go, we use Java, uh, anything that you can up with. So this is a bit abstract, so I want to give you some examples on how we do things. Um, here is a login page. This is our application. It's fantastically beautiful. Uh, and you can log in. So you don't need a lot to, to generate this. So this is a very simple thing. And the stack will basically look a bit like this. You only go to ingest traffic. We go to the front end application. That decides, OK, I'm going to render this template and give it back. Done. Nothing else is needed. Obviously, there is some back end stuff going on, like storing your session key in the database or in the Redis thing and making sure all those things are right. But you know, I'm just trying to keep it simple. Uh, I also have a less simple example, literally. Uh, I uploaded a picture of my daughter in, in Binder. Um, and this is a slightly more complex operation. I mean, we've all probably made some web application where you upload a picture, but uh, in our case, we, we store it directly on Amazon S3. So what we do is uh, we ask the web server for a token so that we can upload it to S3. Then uh, when we're done, we tell the web server that we're done. And th that moment, it decides that uh, it needs to check if the file is actually correct or if the file is actually an image and not a video. Or uh, I would like to know uh, all the information that's in the exit data that's in the picture. That's all back-end processing. So there we use the entire stack. 
So in this case, the front-end application would tell the back-end stuff, uh, please give me everything back from uh, this image, identify it, make sure it's really an image, not a, a vulnerability or whatever. Uh, when that's done, it asks the server to generate a thumbnail, then it generates a web version, then it generates any other type of image that we've requested that it should do. And that, that of course, our application is fantastic, so you can configure all those things, but it is, it is asynchronous. It goes back from back-end processing to the message queue, then goes back to back-end processing, uh, and it goes back to the front-end application. In the end, though, you get a fantastic picture of my daughter in the, in the application, which is what everybody wants. Um, yep. <laughs> so what you end up with in the end, and this is the official picture that we share with people, is this crazy architecture. Um, you could tell we're kind of deep into Amazon, uh, and I don't mind really, but you can see that the entire stack is divided into a lot of things. There's a lot of things going on, and everything is separated. Uh, for example, we, we use just the normal load balancers on Amazon to relay the traffic, that's our ingestion. Then we do some web application firewalling, which is uh, also one unit doing its separate things. Uh, that relays traffic to the web instances. That does some things, and then there's a little arrow going up to a message broker, and uh, all the way at the back are all our processing things. We've only drawn six boxes, but there's a lot more. Um, and obviously, because we're uh, pretty cool guys, we do this all with uh, automated deployment for our DevOps people. Uh, that's actually a thing I forgot to mention. Um, one other pro of doing this kind of system is that your DevOps people get a lot more Jenkins jobs to do, which they apparently like. Hmm. I'm going faster than I thought, but that's okay. So in the future, um, because scaling is still a thing that you need to do. Uh, shared nothing remains extremely effective, especially with all the tools that you have from Amazon, for example, or Google, or um, uh, OpenStack delivers. It's super easy to deploy an entire shared nothing architecture anywhere in the world. However, there's a new thing coming up called serverless architecture, uh, where you can essentially do a lot of things about anything really, you, instead of deploying your uh, servers and you're managing your own hardware or uh, you're, you're worried about CPU and memory, you can just deploy some code and that also works. Um, I'm not a fan though because I like getting my fingers dirty with system operation things. So I stick with share nothing. Uh, however, serverless architecture, if you can get into it, is a fun, fun thing to check out. Now, this guy just pointed the five, ten minute play at me, but <laughs> I'm actually at the last slide right now, so. Thanks. Short to the point and very efficient. I love it. First question here. Uh, you mentioned that you use uh, Celery to distribute the tasks that yeah. have to be done. Uh, how do you integrate? Uh, to have a synchronous uh, execution with uh, serving requests, which need to maintain connections, etc. You mean that when you do a salary request, you gotta wait for the result to come back to you? Yep. Uh, we try to avoid that kind of system, um, purely because when you are doing that, you you gotta make something block in your entire stack, and that's not the most efficient way to get there. So what we try to do is we, we tell the user, okay, it's coming, and then the front-end application starts pulling or it, it gets a notification from, okay, this is done, please pick it up. So you use no web sockets? Sorry? You use no web sockets or stuff like that? Uh, we could to give the message back at some point, um, but I, I, don't, I don't really like having an open connection to a server that can die at any second. So I'd rather go for long pulling or uh, server push. Cool. More questions? Yes. Ow. Oh, my leg. <laughs> uh, hi. Na um, thanks for the talk. Uh, maybe an answer for the previous question will be a pusher room. 
uh, a room in Pusher to communicate back with the with your client or something as an idea. And I have a question about your, the broker you are using for salary. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you give me a little bit of details about, uh, about the different brokers or what have you found about it? So you're asking if um, what kind of different brokers there are, right? What are you using or how, why are you using the broker you are using? And because my, I have very similar architecture in my, in my project and I'm dealing with that right now. Okay. Um. <laughs> Not really sure. Uh, we use Redis because we like Redis a lot, uh, and we already have it available anyway. But there are other brokers that, that make a lot of sense when you're starting to scale up. Um, I try to remove layers as much as I can, but for example, a thing like RabbitMQ uh, is very good to use if you want something with more control or if you want to uh, say more things to the applications using it. More questions? How about up at the back? Uh, exciting zone for questions, usually. You've got a little bit more of a contemplative stance, standing a bit further back. It gives you more of an opportunity to formulate an insightful or possibly a stupid question. There's prizes either way. What about up the front? Do, 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 do. Oh. OK, question number two. There's definitely a prize for that. Uh, so you have mentioned that you use Amazon as a backend. Uh, have you actually tried any other uh, cloud provider, like Google Cloud or Azure? Um, yes, we tried. And internally, we're looking at getting into OpenStack just for our internal environments. Uh, but for our production stuff, AWS is very uh, useful to us. We are in a deep strategic relationship with them, so we're not going away from there. Uh, but obviously, we, we look around. We, we see what's going on. And we use some other providers that I'm not liberty to say. Uh, <laughs> to use certain, certain things from. For example, uh, your backups, you wouldn't keep those at the same location as your production clusters. So that's where we go elsewhere. Um, just out of academic interest, though, we, we try to play around and see if we can deploy on, on other things whenever we can. All right, any more questions? Fine. All right. Well, then that lets us uh, right. um, end nice and early. So you've got to oh, wait, wait, wait. There question. is. Ah, <laughs> oh, brilliant. Here we go. Thank you, sir. Just uh, again about salary. Uh, does uh, uh, what kind of guarantees does does it provide? I mean, um, is it uh, exactly one, uh, every message is delivered and so executed exactly once uh, or at least once? Or what? I don't know the gritty details, um, but I, I, as far as I understand, when you just get a message out of there, at some point you have to sign it off as well. That mark it as complete. Uh, I, I think that's a thing that salary manages for you, mm -hmm. but I would assume that that works. We don't see drop messages at least. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? So I, I have one, I guess. Um, uh, Surprise. So, you know, uh, um, you could go for an option like, like you've done. You can have a three-layer architecture where you go, oh, I don't want to spend too much time doing loads of work in my application server, I'm just going to farm off that job to a, to a salary queue, and then I can update the user when the bits are ready. You know, like, uh, and one, why, why bother? Like, why not? So, you know, that means that you can scale your application server and your salary servers separately, but at the end of the day, you've still got to do that computation. So what are the real advantages of saying, okay, you know, rather than having, you know, three application servers and 20 salary servers, why don't I just have 23 application servers, I can still do all the client-side kind of polling by using individual view. I, you know, I can upload my image in one view, I can resize it in a different AJAX request, I can request a thumbnail in a third AJAX request, I can request the metadata in a fourth one, and so on. The main answer that one lies in the simpler applications kind of thing. So when you build a smaller, simpler application, there's a lot less to check. It's easier to verify, it's easier to test, it's easier to deploy, and the function that you did just has one exact responsibility, and that is doing that what it is to do. If you say, I'm going to put everything in the application server, you suddenly have a whole large code base with uh, separate tracks to getting there, making sure that the code operates well with each other. You cannot build changes in one system that will have no effect on the other. Um, I think it makes life simpler if you, if you just pull them apart and when, when you ask a thing, say, can you say A, and it says A, and it will never say B. 
Okay. Does it help? <laughs> Actually, on more, uh, you can, I was uh, to continue his answer, you can optimize services. So, for example, if you have a shipping service, if you had everything in the same application, you would have to, for example, if you are using Python for everything, you either have to go with C bindings. But if you, you could actually change the backend and say, this other service is specialized, it's written in assembly, and I don't have to maintain it, but it's super effective. <laughs> Any questions rather than answer to questions uh, from the floor? <laughs> Anything else? Rack your brains, everyone. Here's our speaker. He spent loads of time preparing his slides. In that case